I don't do too many takes because uh, I don't want to give them the opportunity. If a director says, try it this way, and I know it's wrong, but I'm doing them a favor by doing it in a certain way which I instinctively know is wrong, I'll blow the take halfway through us, you know, or I'll refuse to do it because I know that they'll print that because I've done that sometimes and you think, why the hell did I do that take? Because it's awful and they'll print that because they think that, uh, so I don't do that now. I just say, that's it, you got it. I say, is it in focus, you got it? Good, let's move on. You're not going to improve after five, six, seven, eight, ten takes. You're not going to improve. You're going to get any better, you're going to get worse. You start acting. And that's the thing you've got to avoid is to stop acting. Anthony Hopkins is the greatest actor of all time. I've known about Tony since I was about 13 when I was first introduced to Silence of the Lambs by my father. I think I was 13. I remember when I was little that my, my twin sister and I used to go up to our bedroom and we had a little tape recorder and we would record Tony doing his lines from Silence of the Lambs and we'd just play it back to us ourselves over and over and over again. And I, I still have those tapes somewhere. Anthony Hopkins' acting philosophy is kind of what I started out as an actor believing. Anthony Hopkins goes over his lines up to 200 times when he's going over a script because he wants to know it like the back of his hand. He wants to know it so well that he doesn't have to think about it. Tony has a great memory. He once recited a seven-page court document to the cast of Amistad in one go. He's pretty incredible. He's an, he's an amazing mimic as well. He can, he can do lots of, lots of different accents and he can mimic other celebrities and other people. I like it that the amount of prep work that he does for a role, and he doesn't do a whole bunch of analysis, he just goes over his lines a bazillion times. And through going over your lines that much, you learn about your character, and you learn about the deeper meaning of what you're saying and stuff like that. He makes really interesting choices. He, d he said in an interview in Larry King that Hannibal, or Hannibal the Cannibal, his portrayal is so famous because he made the opposite decision of what you would think, because for the first 20 minutes of the film, uh, Hannibal is set up as this atrocious, horrible monster who kills and eats people that they don't even know what to call him. But uh, I think Lecter was one of my favorite because it was so easy. How did... easy? Yeah, dead easy. Well, it's a trick, you know. What do you mean? Well, the, the, the first 15 or 20 minutes is built up describing this monster, you know, and to Jodie Foster, and then she goes to the prison and um, the governor of the prison said, she said, what's he like? Oh, he's a monster. So they go down. So it's all built up. There's this monster in a cell in the cage somewhere. The thing is to do the opposite. Play not a monster. Just play someone who's, good morning. You're not really left behind, are you? Clarice. Clarice. The level of preparation, the level of prep work that he does betrays the, 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 the fact that he's so kind of easy in his line delivery and that a lot of the time he's very nonchalant about his line delivery. Not always, though. What have you just wait? Just knock the earth off, flow! It belies the amount of prep work that he's done for the role. He makes it seem so easy, but it's not. He's been working for a really long time, really hard, going over his lines over and over and over again. I also really like his personality. He seems like a really kind of tough dude. I learned in an interview that I was watching with him and Larry King that he said, I'm a, I'm a recluse. He says, I don't have any friends. I'm, I'm not an unfriendly person. I enjoy people, but I, 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 I'm not a great mixer. I love being on my own. I love being a recluse. I, I'm not a recluse, but I, I love being on my own. And I was like, what? I'm sure that everybody wants to be Tony's friend because he's so incredible. But the more he talked about it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna link that interview in the description so you can watch it in your own time. Hearing that interview, watching that interview made reminded me a lot of my sister. Um, Tony didn't do well in school, he didn't focus on his schoolwork, he wanted to paint and draw and make music. And my twin sister is the exact same way. He doesn't seem like he has an ego. His father was a baker. He grew up in Wales. He was born in 1936 on New Year's Eve. And he said, I always thought that I was, I 
really thought I was stupid because he just never did well in school. He went to the Royal Welsh College of Music and Art, I believe, and then he joined the service for two years. After he was in the service for two years, he went to Prada, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts in London. His first professional stage debut was at the Palace Theatre, where he was seen by Sir Laurence Olivier, who asked him to come to the Royal, the Royal National Theatre, where he understudied him. His first film role, role was in 1967 in A Flea in Her Ear. He got his big break in 68 when he starred as Richard the Lionheart in The Night Winner with Audrey Hepburn. So my, my favorite performance that Tony does of all time is by far Silence of the Lambs. Good evening, gentlemen. Okay, Doc, grab some flora. Same drill as before, please. Mm -hmm. when you are, Sergeant Pamwee. Probably my second favorite film of his is The Elephant Man. I've been thinking about Mr. Bites. What on earth made you think of him? Well, I'm beginning to believe that Mr. Bites and I are very much alike. It's absurd. It seems that uh, I've made Mr. Merrick into a curiosity all over again, doesn't it? I mean, this time in a hospital rather than a carnival. My name is constantly in the papers. I'm always being praised to the skies. Patients are now expressly asking for my services. Of course they do, because you're a very fine doctor. John Merrick is happier and more fulfilled now than he's ever been in his entire life, and it's completely due to you. What was it all for? Why did I do it? Freddy, what are you trying to say? Am I a good man? Or am I a bad man? There's also another actor that I really love, who I'm going to make another video about, called John Merrick. Sorry, John Hurt, who was in The Elephant Man, who played The Elephant Man. And The Elephant Man is actually a real person. His name was Joseph Merrick, not John Merrick. He, he was actually a real person. Um, and um, Tony actually got the role of Hannibal because the director of Silence of the Lamb saw him as Dr. Frederick Treves in The Elephant Man. And was like, and Tony was like, why did you cast me in this role? And the director said, well, I saw you as Dr. Frederick Treves in The Elephant Man. And he said, well, Dr. Frederick Treves is a good guy. And the director said, there's something in Hannibal that's good, but basically mad. And Tony goes, I got it. There's a scene in which Tony, um, see, uh, Frederick Treves sees the elephant man for the first time. And there's this one tear that comes down his face when he sees him. And I think most other actors would have gone, oh, good, yeah, gross. Because that, that's what your reaction would be. I don't know if the director came up with that or if Tony came up with that himself, but it's completely random. Another favorite film is Remains of the Day. He played a butler in a mansion um, in which the rule is that you can't have any kind of romantic or sexual relationships with anybody else that you're working with. And this new maid comes in, who becomes like the head of the household, Emma Thompson, and he starts to have feelings for her and she starts to have feelings for him, but he's so cut off emotionally that he can't even really wrap his brain around the fact that he loves her. And there's a beautiful scene with them together in 
which Emma Thompson's character confronts him while he's reading a book and says, are you reading a racy book? And the butler tries to keep the book and Emma's character takes it from him and finds out that it's just a sentimental love story. And the way that Tony looks at her and his refined, his, his sense of refinement in that film is really, really wonderful. For that film, he was nominated for an Academy Award and won the BAFTA. Shadowlands is a 1993 English biographical film about C.S. Lewis. About C.S. Lewis's marriage to Joy. I can't remember what her last name is. But it's a true story. Um, his first and only wife was diagnosed with cancer and died. And C.S. Lewis took custody of her child. And uh, there's a moment in which Lewis realizes that he is in love with Joy. And it's quite a beautiful scene. How could Joy be my wife? I'd have to love her, wouldn't I? I'd have to care more for her than for anyone else in this world. I'd have to be suffering the torments of the damned. The prospect of losing her. Another film that I love of his is The Mask of Zorro, which he plays Zorro, which is really interesting because Zorro is supposed to be Spanish. Um, and Tony Landeras plays opposite him, and Tony is, Zorro is training Antonio Banderas' character to become the new Zorro. And uh, there's a scene in which uh, Tony is teaching Alejandro, uh, Tony is teaching um, the boy to fight. And Antonio Banderas is like waving the sword all around and crap. And Tony just like goes and just knocks it away from him really easily. That that cut that kind of character is the kind of character that Tony seems to be cast in. That's kind of his his type. And then Mitra Black. That's a great film. Um, Tony plays a billionaire and he's approached by death in the form of a, a person. And he has to come to terms with the fact that he's going to die. And there's a scene in which he has a heart attack. And when I first saw it, that scene, I was just like, actually watched all of Westworld, but Tony plays the main, I, I can't remember what his name is, but the, the dude who like oversees Westworld. And there's a really incredible video on YouTube called What Makes Anthony Hopkins a Great Actor. And the guy, it's Nerdwriter. I really love Nerdwriter. He breaks down this one little teeny weeny scene in which he breaks down all these different little facial expressions that you see Tony go through in the course of a scene and how they're all so subtle and so varied. And I had never done anything like that before, of like taking apart all the different, you know, little tiny minuscule details of his performances before. So when I watched that, I was like, wow, this is incredible. But that's about all I have to say. Thanks for watching. This one is for you, Adrian. Not for you, Polly. Let's go for it. Rocky Five. Let's do it now. Guy goes on the fucking box. <laughs> <laughs>